Automated hacker mitigation, we're going to use fail to ban. And what we're going to do when fail to ban gets a hit, uh, we're going to feed that into a, a really simple, somewhat simple Perl script that is going to inject, automatically inject ACLs, ACLs, access control list into a Cisco router gateway. And this is a pretty neat thing. I've been doing this for a long time. It works extremely well. And uh, follow on next uh, tomorrow, we're actually going to do a lab uh, that um, I have everything already set up. You don't have to install anything. I'll actually hack some PBXs and show you, uh, and I have a Cisco router that we're going to put inside the network, and we're actually going to show you how quickly fail to ban responds in actual attack situations. So that'll be really excellent. So uh, voice networks connected to the internet, constant targets. I'm sure everybody who is who has voice networks connected to the internet. Okay, uh, who has not attempt had a hacker attempt to crack them? Pretty much. Oh, you're the only. Nah, everybody. Okay, so yeah, you're connected to the internet. You're gonna get hacked. So what we're going to do, like I said, uh, we're going to use the fail to ban. It's a log scanner uh, in conjunction with some custom scripts to uh, block hackers automatically. So here's a common, a pretty common attack. Uh, PBX, this was an actual, this is a live PBX. So this was a honeypot I put up on the internet, open, wide open. And you see it went online, uh, what was that, June 21st, up at the top at 17, 14, and 48 seconds. That's when it actually got plugged in and started uh, sitting there waiting. It took three hours and 13 minutes uh, before a hacker scanned the IP, got a SIP response, and then started to uh, blast the system. Uh, noticed, uh, got to chop some out there, but at 20, 27, 58 to 20, 29, 58, exactly 120 seconds, two minutes. It scanned uh, from extension 100 to extension 9999 in two minutes. Now, as an administrator, you may uh, see something going on. How long is it going to take you as an administrator to react to that type of quick attack? Uh, it's almost impossible. So you have to have some sort of automated mechanism to take care of this for you. So uh, these are just, I had just some random extensions. Uh, extension 605 was an, a valid extension on the box, and I had a, a few others. So it got a hit. Once it scanned, it basically did a uh, extension enumeration attack. So the cracker was uh, scanned the box to try to see what extensions were available. It got a hit on extension 602. So then it scanned in my password, by the way, was 1234. I just put a simple password on there. So in two minutes, it enumerated, en enumerated, enumerated an extension. Within 35 seconds of uh, testing passwords against that ext ext extension, uh, it took, uh, it, he got it. And then he started passing calls to the box. Oh, wait, hang on a second. Let me back up. So, um, because this is not coming from the same IP address. So notice that all the attacks were coming from a specific IP address, but the actual call, so he attacked, and within two minutes and 35 seconds, had an extension and had a valid authentication information to register to that extension and pass calls. But notice later, uh, it was um, the attack, the actual calls are coming from another IP address. So that's what, that's what hackers do. They'll use compromised computers somewhere on the internet and just blast and try to get. Uh, no, that is not the URI of my box. Oh, oh, this is, yeah, that's not the actual, this is a custom message that I put in to capture the information and then write it to the CDR so I could see where it was actually coming from. So anyway. And you know, a 011, what is that? That's the international prefix. So anyway, they're hitting my box. So the, the point is, I put a PBX on the internet, uh, and it was successfully compromised within three hours, 15 minutes, and 35 seconds. Doesn't take long. Here's a registration attack, very common. You'll see these, 
But the idea here is I want you guys to get, a, get an idea of what these uh, attackers are looking or what they're sending at your PBX. You got all kind of different stuff. You got characters, you got uh, extension type uh, information, uh, really obscure. You got names sitting in there. Uh, there's a 57 Chevy. So they're really inventive in, in, in how they try to compromise your, uh, your PBX that's sitting on the internet. So hardware, software, who uh, thinks that security is a mechanism that should reside on the PBX? Who thinks PBX should take care of security? A couple people, three, okay, four, five. Uh, now who thinks security should be handled by an exterior component in your architecture? Okay, we got a little bit more. So this is a good debate. We could talk about it for hours about how the PBX should be the, uh, the gate, the uh, defensive mechanism, or how uh, something else should be a defensive mechanism. You want, in, in, the, in the VoIP world, you want the PBX to do voice calls. That's what it's meant to do. You want security appliances, security devices, firewalls to do what they do. OK, so you have this debate, and we could talk about it. But really, in this type of architecture, um, personally, I think security devices should be handling security. Uh, so the fail to ban logs uh, scans when the hackers hacking your box asterisk the PBX is going to put logs and uh, is going to send log files of hey wrong password or does not match ACL it's going to give you information so fail to ban you set up fail to ban to actually scan your log files and when it gets a hit you tell it what to what do you want it to scan or what what, what it's looking for and when you get that specific hit. You fail to ban will actually do something. It will accomplish something. And that's what we're going to look at. Uh, so use of strong passwords is a paramount. Uh, extension enumerate, enumeration uh, is going to happen. People are going to scan you. They'll figure out what extensions you have most of the time. Uh, the, the critical part here is you have to be very, very dynamic uh, with your passwords. One, two, three, four is not a good password. Password is not a good password. So that is the best defense from getting compromised is actually having extremely strong passwords. OK, so now we're going to get into the meat of, of what we're doing here, asterisk uh, specific, in zip.com. Uh, out of the box, the default is context under general is default. And most of the time, nobody has anything in default. You want to make sure that you don't have a general way into your PBX uh, where people can access and make phone calls out. So you want to you make that uh, you know, something bogus. Allow guests? No, you don't want guests. You want everybody to come through a, a, a specific peer to register and know that they're authorized to be there. Uh, auth reject? Yes, always auth reject. So asterisk responds differently with this code. This is how people do enumeration attacks. If you have this set to no, then it's very easy for someone to scan your uh, ex extension range and figure out exactly what extensions you have. If you have uh, auth always auth reject yes, then uh, you can scan it till the cows come home and you're not really sure what extensions are on the box. So this is pretty important. I think it's the default setting now in asterisk, um, asterisk uh, when you compile it from source. Use ACLs. What is ACL? Access control list. Uh, you deny everything and you permit certain blocks. So these blocks would be, say, users on that PBX. Uh, so if the PBX is internal on the local LAN, you still do the same thing in case your firewall gets compromised and they figure out your internal address of your PBX. You want to lock it down. So here you would have just your 192.168 whatever network or 10.10.10 whatever network because this also doing this also gives you specific log entries that tell you somebody's trying to compromise my system so uh, and there's a ton of asterisk uh, security stuff there's a lot more security mechanisms out there than what I'm reviewing today but uh, this is a very specific topic and that we're gonna get through okay uh, Cisco specific ACL is applied to the Cisco switch interface or router interface, uh, can either connected to the PBX side, 
blocking things coming in or the internet side blocking things at the gate. Um, is anybody not understand Cisco access list? Really, really simple. You deny, you permit us, you can do ranges. Uh, so real quick here is uh, we're going we're gonna to permit hosts that you always want to get through. Okay. Anybody recognize 4.55 networks? Who's that? Level three, very good. Yeah, you can have a drink of water. All right. <laughs> so uh, then I'm going to start my denies, OK? So I want to, uh, at the top of the access list with the low numbers, uh, the access list from the, uh, works from the low numbers to the high numbers. So then uh, once I allow things that I never want to get blocked, they're critical services, they always have to get through, uh, then I start denying. So. Once a request comes through this access list, the Cisco looks at the IP and sees where at in the access list. As soon as it hits that match, it dumps that packet. So you want the, you want the denies fairly early on in the access list. And then uh, past that, you can do specific, uh, some more permits for specific networks or port ranges or whatever. And then uh, what I like to do in my access list is I, I list all the, the uh, first octet IPs. So over time, and these are actuals, I can see what IP addresses are, uh, or what IP ranges where a bunch of packets are coming from. So mostly Pakistan, Romania, Russia, India, China, you know, th those net blocks that are reserved for those countries, tons and tons of uh, hacker attempts coming in. Okay, general architecture. Uh, yeah, I'm a ser service provider, integrated solutions. We host PBXs for customers. We have mostly uh, on-net facilities, uh, but then we also have remote users, like home office users, stuff like that. So this is a general architectural layout of what's going on. I have all my PBXs. I have a fail-to-ban server, which we're going to get into. I have gateway routers to my internet peers and the internet. You got all these guys. Uh, you got users and hackers out on the internet. So uh, this is kind of how uh, hacker mitigation uh, flows. Hacker attempts to access a hosted PBX through the attacks, different types of attacks. Uh, PBXs are configured to write log files to the central repository. Our syslog server fail to ban runs on the central repository server, scans the logs, matches patterns, and it runs in a one second interval. So max uh, hacker has is about uh, between one and two seconds to actually attempt an attack. And then once fail to ban comes in, we apply the, uh, the ACL to the Cisco router and block it at the gate. I also have uh, scripts that notify me of all the activity that goes on. So uh, just, uh, just a pictorial of what we just described. An attacker comes in tries to access a PBX. Uh, all the PBXs are constantly writing log files to the, our syslog server. The syslog server detects an attack and then immediately puts uh, access list on the gateways, routers, switches, and basically throws up the firewall and the hacker goes and does something else. Okay. The our syslog server is real simple a Linux-based server, uh, very little load, not much going on there. You can just pick whatever server off the shelf and throw a Debian distribution with our syslog on it. Uh, fail to ban, it's very mature product, it's been around a long time, does a lot more than blocking SIP calls or SIP attacks. It blocks, uh, it has scripts to automatically block for different programs, Apache, SSH, all these different things. It's a great program, not just for what we're using it for. It blocks a ton of other stuff right out of the box. MySQL database, I use a database because I have the central logging server and I have all these PBXs, I get to go to one place and review logs and see what else is going on. It's not just for hackers, but that's, that's just what I use it for. You don't, have to, you don't need a MySQL database. You don't have to look at the log files. Uh, fail to bank and just run without that. At Adiscon Log Analyzer, it's a web-based utility application that uh, uh, drop, drop on top of MySQL 
that gives you visual log uh, file searching and it's a pretty neat little application, very simple. Uh, and of course we use Apache, I use Apache, you don't need Apache. So the last three here are actually uh, optional, but Apache I use for CGI scripts. So the fail to ban will run some scripts, it'll give me notifications and I have web links to actually interact with the ACLs and I do that through the Apache server. <clears throat> Okay, our syslog set up on the central repository server. Uh, out of the box, you have to uncomment these two. It just tells that Linux server that our syslog daemon to run um, the, ser the, the service to listen to uh, port 514 to actually accept log messages from other devices. Out of the box, it doesn't do that. Uh, it has some discard message functions. So you know, you had a bunch of PBXs and it's writing a ton of logs. Uh, you have a quick question? It's a, it's a general out of the box syslog server. So it will take syslog messages on port 514 from any device. Well, no, the R syslog is on a pro is on my private internet. It's it's not accessible to the internet. That's that's a good point. Don't have your R syslog server, uh, you know, accessible <laughs> to the internet. So you have to keep you know some things secure. So anyway, you get all these messages from asterisk because asterisk is a real chatty uh, log file. It it tends to put a lot of stuff. If you have you have phones that are op on the open internet registered to an asterisk server, invariably those phones are going to drop off. You might get some registers, unregisters. So you put in some discard messages so you don't fill up your logs or, or stuff that you really don't need. So you can, you can do stuff like that. Uh, by default, when we uh, do asterisk, asterisk logs to the asterisk uh, message files, you can change that to var log syslog. You can do different things. So you can change where those logs are written to. The R syslog setup, like I said before, whenever anything happens in our syslog or uh, fail to ban, it emails me as the administrator and lets me know what's going on. So this is just the on mail module inside of our syslog. So you just set some, uh, like this, this action uh, every 10th interval. If the message contains wrong password, then I'm going to get that email. Okay, so this is at the bottom of the file, uh, our, our syslog configuration, you would set up, well, what messages as a system administrator are deemed important that you want to get to make sure the system is running. And of course, you do that, our syslog. Now, these are actual config files, so uh, I have the presentation, it's online, uh, along with a Word document white paper, so you can actually cut and paste right out of the Word document into your, uh, your, your servers. PBX setup. So we have a PBX user that's locked down with an ACL. We're going to get a very specific message when that occurs. When somebody tries to enumerate that extension on the PBX, this is the type of message. The, the real critical thing here is uh, the last part is ACL error permit deny. So this is a very specific message that we're going to get. And of course, it failed for 64.34, which is the cracker IP address where the attack is coming from. So in uh, asterisk logger.conf, you uncomment the, it's, it's at the bottom, you're going to uncomment this. This tells, uh, you're going to send, asterisk is going to send syslog local zero, notice warnings and errors. You're going to send that to the syslog uh, daemon on the PBX. Now, we have to restart the module to get that to effect. Yes? I have not looked at 11 and 12, so I cannot answer that question. Can somebody else answer that question? In 11 and 12, is the, is the security mechanism changed at all to where this feature is not in there? Yeah, it's, okay, so it may be adjusted, may need to be adjusted for asterisk 11 and 12, but you should be able to get the same functionality. I don't think they would remove this 100%. Uh, so in rsyslog.com, for etsy rsyslog.com, 
in all Debian or all uh, Linux distributions, your, your local syslog function has an embedded ability to send log files off the system. So anything that goes into your syslog.com file or your uh, var syslog file, your regular system messages, all you have to do is put what facility you want to ship off and you put at an IP address. This is the IP address of your R syslog server. So it's, these tools are already embedded. You don't have to install anything extra in the PBX. The PBX writes to syslog. Syslog writes offnet to the central repository. It's just real simple. Uncomment this line and put this line in your syslog, restart this service, and you're golden. Uh, config files in, are in for fail to ban in the Etsy fail to ban directory. So here's probably the most important critical uh, parameter you want to keep in mind. If you're a service provider or your network that you have phones, you know you have phones registering from this IP address, and you no matter what happens, you never want to block that IP, then you would put ignore IP, you would put that network into this. So you would, assumably, you would put your private IP addresses, you would put your service provider IP addresses, uh, you know, stuff like that, that uh, you'd never ever want to block. Uh, and then uh, we're going to create a rule or a, a jail is what they call it, asterisk. Uh, a couple little switch parameters. You have find time, ban time, a default five minutes. That's usually pretty good. Yes, sir. It, uh, ignore IP parameter affect the performance? Uh, I, I just do net blocks, so I don't have a whole lot. I can't, I, yeah, if, like if you had 20,000 IPs in here, would it affect the performance? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. I can't answer that. I wouldn't think so, though. I mean, fail to ban is, um, it's been around a long time. It doesn't have memory leaks or anything like that. It just, it just sits there and runs pretty good. Uh, and, it's, and the box is so, there, there's almost no load on the box at all when it's running, as far as I can tell. It just does its thing. So in the action, these, these are things we're going to call. So we have an ACL named asterisk. We're going to call this ACL file. It's in the action directory. Or we have to set up the filters for it. So first we set up the jail. It's called asterisk. What we're going to do with it, we're going uh, to now... Filter, what are we looking for in the log files? Well, these are the filters. Uh, regular expression Linux stuff. You know, so it has to be, you know, your dots and your stars and to get this type of uh, stuff. And then we're going to say no matching peer found. Device does not match ACL. So this is, and this is also on Asterisk Security. If you look at Asterisk Security VoIP info, you'll see a bunch of filters that you can plug and play. So you don't have to sit here and decipher reg regular expression in Linux. Just throw this in there, and it's going to match on, uh, on the log files. OK, failed to ban setup, continued. Uh, so what happens after we get a match? We actually get a log file that says, hey, ACL did permit deny. What well, we're going to do, that action, we're going to ban it. And this is the actual script that we're going to call. So it's in the fail to pan. There's another folder under there called action.d. And this is actually going to be the Perl script that we got. So now we're getting into Perl script territory. All right, so here is the Perl script that we run. This is generic Perl, comes with every system. Just load a bunch of Perl modules on your system. Uh, you need the Cisco. And what we're particularly doing is the Cisco Telnet. So we need to load that module in the Perl script. Uh, a couple other things, we're going to load net S S M T SMTP, so this script will actually email us activity that's going on. Yeah, but it's internal to my network, so it's all internal. It's not, I'm not telnetting across the internet or anything. Yeah, this is all secure, this is all behind, I'm not, this is, none of this infrastructure is exposed to the open internet. So you have uh, usage, of course. And uh, so anybody really not familiar with Perl? Does this stuff look Greek? 
Okay, so you guys, especially uh, Philip there, you need to take a class. Uh, but most of the Pearl stuff is, Pearl has been around a very long time. It's very mature. They have great entry-level documentation. Go to the Pearl website, and it's like where to begin, start here, Pearl spelled P-E-R-L, and bam, you're in the program in Pearl. It's really, it's, it's a great language. Uh, it's really efficient. So the Perl script here, there's, there's no magic. I'm not using a ton of uh, variables or anything like that that, that can't be deciphered. It's, it's a really simple uh, Perl script. So uh, here's one thing. Uh, so in my access list, I have a range that I'm denying. So when I get a hacker, I'm counting between 100 and 300. So this is a little neat. If the count, if I open this count file, extract the count data, pro, uh, data parameter, say it's at... Uh, 299 or 300, if it's at 300, then I'm going to just change the count back to 100. So my access list rotate through 100 to 300 on my denies of hackers. So it just kind of rotates through and stays in that one block range. It just doesn't start filling up my access list and it goes on forever with new uh, numbers. Yes? My ACL that I run, uh, shoot, it's uh, about 400 to 500 lines. No, the way the Cisco handles, uh, well, the particular Cisco device that I'm using has an actual ASICS that handles uh, access list. There's no performance. Uh, degradation between running an access list with four entries or running an access list with 4,000 entries. So there's no performance hit there. Uh, it's uh, 6509. You could. In fact, the, the model I got, I got a, I got a uh, Cisco 1800 that I'm going to demo tomorrow. So that might be a good, if we have time, I'll load it up with 10,000 entries, and we'll see if there's a performance hit. Okay, so moving right along, we're going to, these are the commands that actually put the access list into the Cisco router. We call the session, we enter the commands, then we close. I used to, I used to, after I wrote, um, where is it at, close session, I used to run the command write, so when the script actually finished writing the ACL, I used to have the script write the uh, configuration back to memory on the, on the Cisco. But I found that, depending on the, the model of Cisco that you're using, it could take you know, 20, 30 seconds for the script to write, or, or for the Cisco to write its config, and then the script to release that telnet session. While that script is running, uh, you know, if you're getting bombarded with multiple hacker attempts from multiple IPs, you're trying to write those scripts. Uh, so I just decided to not write it and just close it. Happens like instantly. And we'll see that tomorrow. And then what I do is I ACL, uh, uh, ACL count, my data count, uh, data parameter. Say if it's uh, data was 250, I just plus plus in Perl increments it by one. So now the new count is... Uh, 251. Now write it back to the to the file. Uh, real simple stuff here. This is this is not brain surgery. Here's a message that I send to myself. So every time the script executes, I just uh, send an email and says the new ACL has been applied. Telnet session closed. ACL count incremented, uh, and it gives me the ACL that was actually written. It gives me a link. Well, actually, this is a link. So if it was uh, applied in error, I can actually click this link, which is a CGI script, of delete, to delete that ACL. So it gives, it's just a little quicker uh, point and click, delete the ACL if it was applied in error, instead of having to log into the Cisco router and do it manually. Yes? Correct, yes. It will not have those entries in it. No, as a, as a service provider, my router is almost never get rebooted. So 
So it's not really an issue for me. If I have a router reboot in my data center, it's probably from a crash, and I have a lot bigger problems than worrying about what the last ACL was written. But I have, a, I ha I have some other tools in here that I think you'll find uh, useful in that type of situation. So this is an email example, just uh, exactly what was in the Perl script. Comes to me an email, gives me a click. If it was applied in there, I can click that, and it goes out and uh, takes care of the, uh, or removes the ACL. How are we doing on time? Okay. So ACL dis uh, delete script that is called from the link that we just showed you. It's very, very much the same as the apply script, but instead of applying an ACL, it just deletes it. And guess what it does? It emails me the activity and also writes it to an activity file. That's, that's why I, I failed to mention that. So not only does the fail to ban script, the ACL uh, add and delete script, email me. So I have a physical email. I get it on my handheld if I see something going on. It also writes a local log file, writes all that data to a lo local log file on the fail to ban server. So at any given time, I want to go back and review or get those ACLs that might have that might have been missed when or uh, not applied when a reboot might have happened. I can always go back to this list and put those ACLs back in. So I got a lot of confirmation data coming to me, uh, and there's the email that comes back. Uh, the ACL number dot dat is just a local file next to the Perl script that just increments. So it wouldn't be three in there; it would only be one number. It's just dot dat for uh, some data. Okay, ACL changes. This is the text file. File stores a running list and applying uh, applying and deleting ACL. So this is the stuff, the same stuff I get in email goes to that local file. So I can always go back and review. Okay, so here's uh, something interesting is when the actual apply goes into the Cisco router and your access list gets. So this happened on I also, uh, the, the first hit, I don't, fail to ban comes out of the box, it waits for three hits. Uh, but you can set that to, that to activate and uh, do an action on one hit. So I set it to one hit. So here, the first one here, I've got, I got a hacker attempt. It tried to access one of my PBXs, fail to ban act, uh, activated, and put in this access list and I only got one match after the access list was, was applied. This tells me that it's an intelligent scanner, because what happens on a scanner that's scanning, trying to enumerate attacks, it's always looking for a reply. If it does not get a reply, it assumes something's wrong, the PBX is no longer responding, I'm not gonna waste my time trying to carry out uh, 10,000 other extension enumerations or 20,000 registrations or a password attack on a IP address that's not responding. So this tells me it was an intelligent scanner. So it was good to block this guy because he probably had some slick tools. The deny, this guy was probably just a run of the mill cracker uh, automated bot that didn't care. It got blocked, but it still executed its whole run of uh, attempts. Yeah, I did. it's personal preference. You can block the specific IP address. You can block the class C, the class B. You can block the whole class A. You can do whatever you like. It's, it's ultimately configurable for what your, um, how your network's set up and, and what you want to block. Uh, in my logs, I've seen, uh, in my logs, I've seen where uh, a, a guy will attempt from 146 and then 147 and then 148. They'll buy a block of them, put a bunch of uh, boxes on it, and just yeah. keep trying from different IPs. Yeah, it, uh, the whole class E just works for me. It, it, it works in my environment, so uh, that's what I do. So, so to review... So, JR, how do you yeah. handle IPv6? I see no examples. Uh, I have no examples of IPv6. Thank you very much. Put me on the spot, why don't you? Can I finish my presentation, please? So just to review... Uh, so we have the PBXs on, now all this is a private, internal private network, so your syslog is not exposed to the internet. Uh, you have users, you have hackers, they try to attack. The PBXs are writing logs to a central log server. The central log server calls a couple of custom scripts, puts the ACLs on your Cisco devices, and puts up the gateway and thwarts the hacker's attempt. 
So we'll take some questions. I'll leave this slide up. Philip. So how many attempts go through before it's actually blocked? Because with a lot of scanners, you can probably That's a push. great question. We will demonstrate that tomorrow in the, in the lab. It depends on the type of attack and the speed of the attack. Uh, fail to ban reacts within a second. It scans the log file every second, okay? Now, within one second, you could get 400 to 600 attempts on a PBX, okay? Most of the times I haven't seen more than, I think the max that I've seen when I went back and reviewed after a, a, an ACL got applied was maybe about 10 attempts. But in the lab environment, a more controlled environment, I can get, I can, I can slam a PBX with about uh, 400 to 600 attempts before the ACL does get applied. <laughs> not, not to give anybody any ideas, um, but could this be used in a not so good way if somebody were to attack you with a spoofed IP and basically cause a DOS attack with your own ACLs? Well, that's a great question, but remember in one of the first slides in configuring fail to ban, you can put the, the ignore IPs. So you ignore the IPs that you never, ever want to get blocked, and that'll help that situation. 